Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Come on, we gotta get some energy. You guys are gonna fall asleep, I swear. I swear, come on. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Anthony Cooperwood, and I'm going to share a few ideas that I have come across over the last 30 years or so, roaming the world and working as a musician, as an educator. Um, I've been about 25 years on the road, roughly. About 10 of those I was on the road with Circus Leg, we were traveling around the world. I've taught a lot of different subjects of music all around. I've, I've been working with Russian students, Chinese students, French students, Good Spanish, Good usually where English is not our first language. And I've developed a few techniques, a few characteristics that have enabled me to get some of my ideas across to the students. And it's kind of helped me develop a philosophy of teaching that really brings the students into the atmosphere of which we're learning, so they can kind of live the experience. So everything that I do, I try to put the students in that, in that situation so that they can, they can internalize the ideas that we're talking about. They can bring them inside. As long as they can live the experience, then it's much easier to remember. I know that when I write things down, maybe I might remember it, but if I actually live the experience, then it stays with me forever. So I'd like to share a few ideas with you. You like them. I hope that you will. I will challenge you to try them in your classrooms. Uh, if you don't like the idea, maybe you can change it and tweak it to however it might work for you. And just a few things I'd like to share. So let's get right into it. The first thing that I'd like to ask everyone. Now I'm going to assume: Are we all music educators? Do we all know? Okay. But we all know what music is, or do we? <laughs> we right? do. That's, why don't we start there? First question I'm going to ask you, because I always like to go to the source. I like to go to the very beginning, and I'd like to start from there, and I'd like to walk forward from there. What is music? What would you say our definition of music is? What would you say? It's international language. International language, so it's French. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, there's some sort of pattern to the sounds that uh, is recognizable. Okay, recognizable pattern of sounds. What do you, what do you think? Um, just uh, an organization of sounds in a specific way to create some emotion. Ooh, I like that. Or, an organizational form of sound in an effort to create emotion. Right. Okay. Or meaning of some sort. Or meaning of some sort. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to go with all of your ideas. I did a little research because I wanted to talk to my kids about what is music? And we kind of went around the same thing. We kind of did the same thing. Oh, it's, it's a language that can talk to everybody, and everybody can get, you know, there's emotion. So I used the eternal portal of knowledge, the internet, and I found a few different ideas. First, I found Webster's. The art or science of combining vocal or instrumental sounds, or both, to produce beauty of form, harmony, and expression of emotion. I have a problem with that. Can anybody tell me what my problem with that is? Anybody? What? The vocal or instrumental. Vocal or instrumental, that's, that's only part of the problem. What? Well, it, 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 it excludes the notion of subjectivity, I guess. Or... Subjectivity. Who's to decide what's beauty of form? And who's to who's decide expression of emotion? That means, this definition, that means that if you hear music, or this definition of music, that it should make you feel angry, or it should make you feel happy, or the composer means for you to feel romantic. When people listen to the Debussy, oh, my heart swells, and it's so beautiful, and I feel so romantic. Yeah, well, some people don't feel anything. So if they don't feel anything, that means we can't use it because it doesn't achieve one of its objectives, right? So we can't use this definition. So I looked again, and I found another. An art or sound that expresses ideas and emotions. Let's just stop right there. Emotions. Once again, we're dealing with emotions. Music has very little to do with emotions, I think. I think that music can create emotions, but I don't think that we can use emotion in the definition of music. That's like saying, so where do you live? Around here. Well, yeah, but where do you live? Around, it, it's ambiguous, you know? It's not really a definition. So, 
I kept looking, and I'm typing, I'm like, Google, come on, so come on, Google, 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 Google. And I came up with this, an agreeable sound. <laughs> this is, an, uh, I think this is one of uh, Miriam Webster's de uh, definitions of music, an agreeable sound. Can we all agree that that's a sound? Yeah. Can we agree that that's music? No. I'm not sure, <laughs> exactly. Even though you say no, so obviously we can't agree that that's music. So finally I thought, I like to blaze my own trail. Fine. I'll come up with my own definition. And much like she just said over here, I came up with the collective organization pattern, recognizable patterns, right? of two or more sounds put together. That means that if I play a sound right now, and I come back two weeks from now, and I play another sound, then that's music. Because when I made that first sound, I always planned to come back and play the next sound. I always had a plan. I had a strategy. As long as I have that strategy and that idea, then that's what can give me my music. If I just, just play the one sound and, and never come back, maybe, maybe, if that's what I plan to do, then maybe I can consider that as music, but that's kind of sketchy. <laughs> but as long as I have two or more sounds that I've organized and I can put in a pattern, a recognizable pattern, then I can do that. It doesn't necessarily need to express an, an emotion or anything, I, an idea or anything else. It can, but it doesn't have to. Uh, 20th century composer John Cage, have you heard of him? Yeah? yeah? Well, listen to what he says. The background. Uh, also, he works with a stopwatch. The reason he does it is because these sounds are in no sense accidental uh, in, their, uh, in their sequence. They each must fall mathematically at a precise point. Okay, with me, I consider music the uh, production of sound. And since in the piece that you will hear, I produce sound. I would call it music. <laughs> singing, not, uh, no, mus no musical instruments or anything like that, but as long as they were organized and put together, they worked together in harmony to create something that would be pleasing to the ear or not. Now, one thing that, so what, what I'm doing is I'm breaking down our ideals of uh, what we think music is and what we've, been, what we've become accustomed to. So my students right now, their brains are like, oh, but I think I, Oh, okay, I don't know what to think now, which is great. As long as I can throw my students off balance, then I can make them think. As long as I, as long as I can make them think, then I can have them create. But before we do any creation, let's go back even further. I said I like to go back to the beginning. I like to go back to the foundation. Let's go all the way back. How did we get music in the first place? Where does it come from? Does it come from Space? Does God give us music? You, here, have music. How do we come up with music? Anybody? Anybody want to take a chance? We've got two. We've got eyes. Form of communication. Form of communication. Like it. Go ahead. It's an inspiration from different sources of nature. Or 
stop right there. Both of you. Both of you. Right on the mic. Prehistoric man. Prehistoric man created music. And where did he get it from? He got it from the sounds that came around him. The different things that he heard. And he wanted to harness that energy and create something from that. I don't know if there are elephants back then, but you get the idea. Oh, look at that. that. That would be rhythm, right? Exactly what I had in mind. Way back when, I think that man was listening to. I, 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 I got a theory. My theory is way back in the beginning of time, or beginning of man, they were all sitting around. We've got this clan, right? We've got our clan of the cave bear, all right? And these people have to work together. Now we have, this is a disjointed society. We don't have transportation, there are no roads, there's nothing like that. We just have clans of people living together for survival. Everybody knows that if you're on your own, you have a much less chance of survival. But if you're together in a group, then you have a better chance of survival. So my idea, and I take my students through this, we divide the students up into two groups. We send one group over here, we send one group over there, and we say, try to communicate with each other. Try to talk. Well, they can't really hear each other because they're far apart from each other. So, I came up with this idea. I was thinking, you said communication. You said nature. What I think, can you envision, if, let's say it's time for hunting, all right? We've got to go and we've got to go get food. The whole clan has to work together to do this. But we have to cover a large distance and we can't do it all in one group. So let's split the group in half. One of the sounds that you heard on the recording that can carry over large spaces, not the elephant or the horse or anything like that, those are local sounds. I think the bird would be our best option of carrying sound over a large space. It can be carried on the wind. You can hear a bird a mile away. If the wind is just right, you can hear that. So my idea, I think the cavemen were very, very smart. I think that they were actually quite brilliant to be able to do what they did without, you know, without the, the, the modern technology that we would think of. So if they heard a bird speaking to another bird, what's one thing that a bird might say to another bird? There's food, There's food over here. Hey, whistle, whistle, whistle. There's food over here. Come over here. This is where the food is. So if, can you imagine if you split your cave group into two groups, You've got one group that goes north, you've got one group that goes east. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and one group wants to talk to the other group and signal, maybe they might use some sort of a sound. Maybe somebody in the tribe can whistle really well. I can't do that thing. You know, the people who, you know, and some people do, do it with their tongue. I can't do that. And I don't think that they could either. But I do think that they were able to improvise. Remember, I think that they were brilliant. And that's why the first musical instrument that was ever found, well, that we know of, goes back all the way to either 40,000 years ago, 40,000 BC, or 60,000 BC. It's called the Neanderthal bone flute. They found one. And this is what they think it's going to look like. That's it. It comes from the leg of a, of a cave bear.
bone flu, 60,000 BC. Now, I don't think there was some caveman in a, <laughs> in a cave going, <laughs> You know, a professional musician can make music from a pop bottle, right? So I think this is a bit ambitious. But what I do think is I think that they were able to make loud tweaks, maybe blasts of sound that would be able to signal somebody else that, hey, this is a not a natural sound, this is me, I'm part of your clan, and I'm over here in the north, and we found some food, come and check it out so you can help us bring it down, kill it, and bring it back, because that stuff is heavy, right? Okay, so this is our Neanderthal bone flute. So once again, what I'm trying to do with my students is I'm trying to build time bridges. I'm trying to build cultural bridges that will link us from now to the past so that they can see the things that are around us have some kind of a link to the past. The whole purpose of this workshop is to try to bring music history or things of the old into your classroom so that the students can kind of take some interest in it. Maybe they'll think about it, maybe they'll want to go further with it or whatever, just to, so that they can take something of value. I think this is one way that we can do that. Another way that we can do that is we can take things that we see, everyday things that we see, and we can link them to the past. So what I've done, I came up with some musical instruments that we have now that uh, have links that go way back. Can anybody think of a couple, just, just a couple of instruments that we have now that go way back? A drum. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's too easy. Come on, man. Flute. A flute, well, you just saw the flute. Flute has an origin about 60,000 BC. Organ. Yeah, yeah, that, no, no, the flute's cool. What else? Maracas. The maracas, the shakers, okay. All right, this is what I came up with. Uh, yeah. Right there. The flute. Going back 43,000 BC. Some people say 40,000, some people say 60,000. It, it, it's old. What do you got? We got a horn. We're going to get to that. That's right down here. We've got the harp. Everybody knows what a harp looks like. I don't think that it looked like that way back when, but we're, take, we're going to trace its origins back to around 4,000 BC in ancient Egypt. But we still use it. We don't use lyres so much, but we do use a clarinet. The lyre and the double clarinet come from about 3500 BC. We've got orchestral percussion, this drum back there. We've got, they go back to 2000 BC. Now this is not the modern orchestra that we know of as percussion, but basically we've got, we've got rhythmic instruments that can keep a beat, like our drum. We stretch the skin over something and we hit it and that gives us our, our drum sound. We're gonna go on to the tambourine. The tambourine, the guitar, and the trumpet, or the horn, or we can trace that back to around 1500 BC. Once again, we're not talking about a trumpet with valves, but we're talking about metal. The, Mete the Mesopotamians began to work with metal around that time, and they began to shape that metal into instruments. Once again, we're not going to be ambitious and try to make some beautiful you know, Arturo Sandoval jazz or anything, but they're able to play fifths and intervals by pitch. And then, down here, my favorite, first sheet music comes to us from 2000 BC. I use sheet music every day. Who plays an instrument in here? Anybody? You use sheet music? Yes. Yeah. You? Yeah. Everybody knows what sheet music is. Paper, you got notes on it, right? The Mesopotamians didn't have paper but they had language, and our first, one of our first written languages was, anybody? Cuneiform. Remember those symbols and shaped triangles and all that stuff? <coughs> well, before then, we didn't really have an organized system of, here's my melody, I want you to play my beautiful, sweeping melody. We didn't have that. We had not the caveman tweets and blurps, but we had some, it was just more random. I could play the tune and I could ask you to do it. You probably wouldn't play it the same way I did. And then after about a month, you may not remember the way I did it, and you'd probably do it completely different. Well, the Mesopotamians thought, you know what, let's try to come up with an organized form so that we can remember the songs that we're writing. So what they did, they, once again, 
this is not necessarily the first, but this is the, the first one that the scholars are recognizing. They found this hem. They found this hem carved into rock. Remember, they didn't have paper. Well, what they did do is they had this soft stone, and they carved the images in the stone, and they took this hem. It's called the, the hem of uh, uh, Nikal. I believe she was the wife of a moon god. And what did we usually come up with music for? Usually we were doing, we were using music to celebrate, probably some kind of a religious deity of some sort. They were worshiping the moon gods. Well, this is a hymn to his, his wife. And it sounded, maybe it sounded like this. Now basically we're talking about, the music is telling us maybe not these specific notes, but a description of how these notes should go. And from this description, they've detected that these notes should come from here. Somebody can ride on a horse for about a month and take it someplace else, and they can play kind of the same kind of thing. So that's our first notation, going back 2,000 years, and we still use that today, just on paper, which is a lot lighter than rocks. All right, now <clears throat> we're getting ready to get into an area where we're starting to compose music. So this is great because we have a few people that are not music educators, maybe that cannot read music. Can you read music? I'm going to teach you how to read music today. I'm going to tell it. I'm going to do it the same way I work with my students. And those of you that do not know how to read music, this is a way that I do it. Maybe you like it. Maybe you can use it. Maybe. I like to tell stories. Everybody loves a good fairy tale, right? Everybody loves to, to hear a nice story. So I tell a story about the House of the Eleven Lines. Back in the way back, Back in history, there was once upon a time, and I always like to start with once upon a time. It's so funny because my, my, my juniors and my seniors, it's so funny. They're, they may be older and they're so cool and everything, but once you hear the words once upon a time, don't you just look up and wait for what's going to come up next? It doesn't matter. It, it, it goes back to when we were six and five and four years old. Usually a story would start with once upon a time, and you knew something good was going to happen. Well. I like to say, once upon a time, there was a house. And in this house, there were 11 lines living together. And these 11 lines were just stacked on top of each other. And it was just complete confusion and pandemonium. And there was not a lot of space. So when their friends would come over to play, they would be all confused. Nobody would know where everybody would be around. Everybody would be pushing each other and shoving each other. And nobody, there was just very little organization. So one day, one of their friends said, you know what? There's just too many lines living here. So I'm going to take one of you. Why don't one of you come and live with me? So they took one of the lines away. And when they did that, they created an upstairs and a downstairs. Right? How many of you have basements in your, in your homes? A few of you. You're familiar that the downstairs is the basement, right? So the guy that took the line away came back and said, oh, this is so much better. We've got an upstairs, we've got a downstairs, that's great. Now let's, 
I'm not calling stairs because we don't use stairs in music. Let's call them clefts. So instead of upstairs, downstairs, we're going to call them up clef and down clef. And then, then he went a little bit further and he said, you know what? I'll tell you what. Let's come up with a name. This is the one on top, right? All right, so we're going to call this treble. And then downstairs the bass man, we're going to call that bass. the bass clef. <laughs> so we've got our treble clef and we've got our bass clef. Tell you what, you use that, and what, you'll never forget that. You got a bass clef down here, so we've got these symbols. So before I show you the symbols, I'm going to ask you one more question. One thing I ask all my students, especially when we're learning to read music, do you know your alphabet? Do you know your alphabet? <coughs> so you, you kind of look so slow. <laughs> so <laughs> I tell all the kids. Okay, let's all say our alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And they say, and then they just say, stop. And then I say, one more time, say your alphabet again. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, stop. What comes after G? H, no. <laughs> Music alphabet, there is no H. So, um, Actually, it is. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Actually, it is. Hold on, hold on. Go. Um, I like that. That's cute. I use that with my seniors. <laughs> I don't want to hear from you yet. <laughs> okay, actually, it is age. Depends uh, how you study music. No, wait, say, wait, wait, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> We're talking elementary concepts. Okay, fine. <laughs> learning to read music. And that's the thing also that you have to keep in mind. We keep everything simple. We don't lie. That story that I told you about the 11 lines is debatable. I went on the internet to do some research about those 11 lines, and there are scholars that feel that music was not like that, that we saw in the very first. So what I do is sometimes I pick and choose facts that I think will stick in their heads. If I give it to stick, fine. If they figure out the truth much later, that's fine too, because it means it stayed on their mind that they had to dispel what I told them. So maybe there is an H. In German? In German, but I'm not speaking German. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing is, everybody in this room is going to keep in their mind, oh, but there might be an H. It is. And maybe somebody here will go on the internet and they'll see, in German, there's an H. It is. But it'll stay in their mind long enough for them to go and check it out for themselves. You see? You see how the stories work? And so we start with the alphabet. We go from A to G. That's all you need. And the cool thing about it is this, it's cyclical. It just repeats itself over and over and over and over again. A, B, C, D, F, G, A, B, C, D, blah, 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 blah. All the way up, all the way down. And so, like I said, we'll go on to the next one. You can see that right here. A, B, C, D, F, G, A, B, C, D, F, G, blah, blah, blah. all the way up. And immediately, when I first teach when I first uh, when I first teach the, the lines, I teach them ledger lines as well. Because when they learn the ledger lines, it's an extension of this. And once they learn the ledger lines, they won't forget this. They'll be like, oh, they might forget the direction that it goes, whether it goes up or down. They might forget that it starts from A and goes up, but they won't forget that it's sequential that one letter follows the next letter, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. And remember that 11th line that moved away? Well, it left a remnant. It left a remnant right here in the form of, what do we call this? Middle C. Middle C. It's the only note on the entire grand staff that looks like this. Sure, there's one that looks like it up there, but that's not middle C. There's one that's down here, but that's not middle C. There's only one that's between the up stairs and downstairs, the up clef, down clef, the treble, and the bass clef. There's only one. And that's how the kids remember middle C. So no matter what, no matter where they are, no matter where they forget how things work with the staff, as long as they can remember that this is middle C, that can be their, their grounding point. That can be their capstone. And they can start from there. Maybe they, like I said, maybe they might get it backwards and go the 
wrong direction. But if they can remember that this is middle C and it's the only note like it, then it serves as a key that unlocks the rest of the mystery. And that's how we're going to do, that's how we're going to read our music. So we've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Now we could, depending on how smart your students are, because I've got some real smart outs in my group. I have to push them a little bit further. I take them and I start talking about Pythagoras. You guys know about Pythagoras? Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's about triangles and stuff like that. The whole point is Pythagoras came up with the basis of our diatonic scale way back when. It's a long story. He was walking down the street, looked into a metal shop, and heard the different hammers making different noises. He wanted to figure out why they were making different sounds of different pitches. So he went in and checked out the weights of the hammers. He went home. He figured out that he could take some cord and he hung some weights on it and twang, twang, twang. The different weights would pull different notes, different pitches. And then he was able to apply those, apply that mathematically. And then somebody else, the uh, Aristoteles of uh, something, came up with the actual diatonic scale that we have. You can go further in that if you want to. It depends on your students. If they challenge you, if they push you and say, oh, this is baby stuff, then throw that at them. And then we start breaking it down into a language that they want to hear. Some of my kids want to hear it, some of my kids don't want to hear it. So anyway, uh, where are we right now? Okay, so we've got all of our lines here, but we don't want to keep doing these at this alphabet every time we want to hear um, every time we want to hear the note, or we want to know what a note is. So we teach them the mnemonics. The mnemonics. You know, every good boy does fine. Uh, good boys do fine always. And uh, for the spaces for treble clef, we're using F A C E. For bases, we're using all cars eat gas or all cows eat grass. That's the one that I learned. And inevitably, my girls always come. Why is it have to be all boys? Why is it have to I don't have one for girls. I just don't. <laughs> not yet. And uh, so when I but but the one thing when we do learn it and I do test them on it, I ask them to give me exactly what I tell them. Sometimes they want to change it on the test, and I count it wrong because it's not what I told them. The reason I do that is because the moment you start changing the information, the moment it starts to slip away from you. So I make them repeat exactly what I told them, then I know that they know it. Once I know that they know it, they can do whatever they want with it. I don't care what they do with it. But they have to prove to me that they can master what I've given them before they change it. Because it, it's so, it's, I, had, I had a kid do that, I've had several kids do that, they change it, they got it right this time, the next time I ask them what it is, they can't remember. Oh, what did I change it to? Wait, what was it before? See? So, learn it my way, and then you can do whatever you want. Okay. Oh, good. We're good for time. We have Gregorian chant. Does anybody know what Gregorian chant is? You've all heard Gregorian chant. For anybody that doesn't know what Gregorian chant So I thought, hmm, how can I make this accessible 
to students that don't want read music to don't know how to write music because they can't read music. So first, we teach them to read music. So I've just taught you how to read music. Rudimentary, maybe you can remember what I just said, but ultimately, if we spend more time on it, usually everything, everything that I'm saying to you usually takes place over a week or two weeks. We're able to test, we're able to play games, we're able to spend time discussing. We're kind of flying through all of this right now. But when we spend time, we can really internalize it. Once you've internalized it, I said, we have to apply it. Once we apply it, we can uh, retain it forever. So the first thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to compose a Gregorian chant with my kids. So what the hell am I going to do that? Once again, with your higher learning, sure, we can get all into the ins and outs of, oh, these people sang it this way, and these people wrote it this way, and these monks did it this way. We don't go into all of that. We make it so simple for them that, that, they, that they just can't help to be able to do it. So what, did I, what I did is I came up with some guidelines. We have to establish simple rules that they can follow and get what we're looking for. So what I did, came up with this, with these guidelines. First, we choose a mode. What's a mode? We'll get to that in a minute. Two, we have, we have to establish simple rules that they can follow. Because we have to, once again, remember we talked about a pattern, a recognizable pattern, organized sound. Well, we have to give them rules because they don't know how to organize the sound. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick notes within one octave. Boom. That's the first thing. So that they're not writing all over the place. So they don't have to worry about what these notes are with the legend lines that we talked about. They don't have to do that. One octave, we're good. Two, we're not going to make the approaches to the notes any greater than a fifth. It doesn't sound very good with lots of skips if you don't know how to musically resolve them. So once again, nice, simple exercise for them. Approach the notes, no greater than a fifth, up or down. Leaving the notes, no greater than a third. What we're looking for is we're looking for an easy contour. We don't want music that's going like this, and up and down, and up and down. We want it to have a nice contour. We want something that's going to be musical. M musical. We're going to look for that smooth contour without many skips and leaps. We're going to start and end on the tonic. The tonic is the, the first note of the key that you're writing in. We don't have to get into, you know, what uh, all the different keys and all the different notes and explaining all of those things. We don't really have to go that far. We give them a starting point, and where you start is where you end. Basically, yeah. Sorry, I'm just uh, maybe I'm just not getting it. Uh, you say approach a note no greater than the fifth, leave a note no greater than the third. So how, how would you kind of fourth in there? Because I just the point of reference to leave versus approach. So you're leaving. So you're oh, I see what you're saying. You're I see what you're saying. Uh, oh, no. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, you, jump. Can, you can jump approach. between the intervals. I think what I'm trying to say yeah, is exactly. you don't jump to a six. That's right. Right. You can jump to a, you know second, third, fifth, or fourth, right. or fifth, right. but no greater than a third. Right. Did I say it wrong? Leave notes no greater than a third. Now, when you leave the note, I don't want you to make a fourth. I don't want you to jump down a fourth. It's like a descending. Right. Right. Okay. I only want you to go like maybe a second or a third, but not much further. Because if you're jumping up there and then you're jumping off, then your music is making too many skips and leaps. Does that make sense? So approach means descending and leave means descending? Uh, no. Okay. When we're moving, when we're writing our song, going from left to right, we're going to go from one point, either up a fifth or down a fifth. It doesn't matter. Okay. And then we're going to leave going down a, the opposite direction in like a third or less. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, actually, because I never asked me that before. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're looking for that smooth contour. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to give them four measures, just four measures. We're not looking for greatness here. Mm. Gregorian chants are usually written in Latin. Yes? It's a dead language. Nobody speaks it anymore. In Vatican, they do. In where? In Vatican. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I think that's great. They do. <laughs> I wish I would have taken Latin. 
If I would have spoken Latin, I, I would be able to speak French, German, Spanish. I'd be able to speak everything of the Romance language because they're all based in Latin. Why did they stop teaching Latin in our schools? <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't have wanted to take Latin, <laughs> but I should have taken Latin. Um, so, how can the kids write in Latin if they don't speak Latin and they don't teach Latin? Well, we deal with Latin every day in different forms or another, because we, most of us speak Romance languages, so we're using the language. So what we do is I've come up with a way that we can use Latin and compose a song. So if you look at that handout that I gave you, if you go to the second page, then you'll see that there's a list of Latin phrases. These are Latin phrases that are in use all the time, whether it's in a song or whether it's on a pity, E pluribus unum, right? Or semper fidelius, or carpe diem. These are all phrases that we're familiar with. And what we do, I tell the kids, take one of these phrases, or take some of these phrases, put them together, and make them make sense. First of all, so their text has to make sense. They have to have some kind of a message. And if you kind of word jumble those around somehow, you can get some names from them. Basic meanings, but you can you can say something with the list that you have there. Now, if you look on the back of the first page, just to the left of it, you'll see that I've written four measures there. This is for you. You can write your own Gregorian chant, and I'm going to show you how. I told you about modes just for a minute. Let's talk about modes just for a brief moment. Just a brief moment. We want to spend some time on modes. It's probably going to take you about a week or so, maybe one, one or two weeks, to really discuss it so that the kids can understand the major and the minor and, all, and how they relate. Um, but this is basically it. These are our modes. I don't play like my Aunt Lola. I don't play like my Aunt Lola. That's how you can remember the order of them. And I have found a lot of Gregorian chants that are in Phrygian mode. Once again, you don't have to go into great detail, great discussion. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, Phrygian mode, which is on the what? The one, two, three, the third. Which means that we start our Gregorian chant on the third. To make life simple for them, let's keep it in the key of C so that they're not using the black notes and having to deal with F sharp and G sharp and all of those accidentals. We don't want that. We want to keep everything very simple. So I choose Phrygian mode, and in the key of C, Phrygian is E. That means that our Gregorian chant will start and end on E. And you can write any notes that you want in that space. I usually give them one more guideline that I didn't write here. Seven or eight notes should be good. Seven or eight. You don't want lots and lots of different notes. So five, six, seven. Five is a bit short, but six, seven, eight notes, that's about enough. So you got E on the beginning, E on the end, and about five or six notes in between. And that should be plenty of, uh, of musical vocabulary for them to say what they want. So I actually did one with my kids, and we came up with this. <coughs> Actually, it has a very simple message. The kids can do it too. 
And it's whatever, whatever Latin text you want to come up with. You can even tell the kids to go online and do their own research, find Latin text. The internet is a powerful tool. They can go on the internet and find their Latin phrases and come back with homework, say what, whatever they want to say. I had one kid that came up with really, really nice uh, lyrics for our school. He, he, he went the extra mile. I was, I was super impressed. So we move on. <laughs> century text in a class three months ago from something I taught them a year ago. Once you do it and internalize it, it stays with you forever. None of these kids will ever forget this. They may not have liked it, but they'll never forget that they did it. So um, we're getting short on time. I don't want to run you long. We do have more. We, we're still we're good on time. Um, I want to take you through a couple other things, and we're just going to get right through them. One of the other things that I try to do with my kids in school is I try to break down their ideas of how they listen to music. Every time we, every time we turn on the radio, every time we go out in public, we are inundated with music in some form or another. Whether we wake up to the deep, deep, deep of our alarm clock or the microwave, that beep, we recognize music in different and various forms throughout our entire life. So what I was thinking is, well, why don't we, what would happen if we tried to think about the way that we listen to music so that we can understand what it is that we're listening to? Well, I, I thought that we could take pop tunes, and pop tunes are very nice. Maybe we like to listen to them, maybe we don't. But the one thing that's consistent is the chord structure. It's not complicated. So first, I went, you know, I like to go back to the source. So I went back to Paco Bell. In 1680, 
Paco Bell was a canon in me. This is 1680. Everybody knows this song, right? If you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard this song. And it goes on forever. Western chord structures. And they're there in Korea, and they're like, <sighs> and they were amazed and astonished. The thing is, the whole point is, anybody can write a song. You can write a song with your kids. If you use a formula, maybe you can use the, you remember the, uh, the, the 50s, every song in the 50s sounds like,
every song sounds like that. Or if you want blues, you can one, four, one, five, four, one. Very simple, right? Well, that's also rock and roll. That's also all of the so all the rock and roll songs that happened in the 50s and the 60s. They're all based on the same either one chord or four chords or five chords. The last slide I want to show you is to prove to you that anyone, and I mean anyone, can write a song. Watch this. This is ridiculous. But it's reality. You know what this is. Anybody can write a song. Discussion on boogie woogie piano playing. I went to YouTube. 
we did boogie woogie piano play and we went into swing dancing. You know that jitterbug dancing that they were doing? Then we were discussing that. So such a powerful tool. That very last link on the page of, um, I, I gave you something, the very last page is some different, it's just a, a long list of uh, places where you can find sources for kids and for yourself to bring music into your classroom in a different way. And the very last link there, the dturl.com, D-E-T-U-R-L, will allow you to download any YouTube video. You just bring it to there and you can get the video or you can get the MP3 from the video. It's a pretty, pretty powerful uh, uh, little link there, so I thought maybe you might be able to use it. That's it for me, everybody. Thank you very much.